Hi, my name is Jay and I'm with Virtual Care. And I wanted to talk today about a program we have coming up on September 22nd. It's going to be called Better Breathing in Eight Steps. And we're gonna give a little introduction today about it. The official program starts on the 22nd, which is a Tuesday of September. It will be 12 p.m. on Pacific Standard Time and 3 p.m. on Eastern Standard Time. And what we're gonna do today is give you a little bit of the highlights of what you can anticipate and a little taste of what each class will look like. So to begin, I wanted to just go over what we'll be talking about in each of the classes. They're structured so that we'll bring up one specific topic or two that are common for people that have chronic lung disease. And these will entail both strength training, breathing exercises, energy conservation tips, how to take this information and put it into use so that you can increase your functional activity tolerance, how to handle the anxiety that sometimes comes or often comes with loss of breath, talk about some of the psychosocial issues or the details about relationships and how they sometimes change when you have to be provided for, and talk about quality of life. So we'll be delving into each session a little bit more detail. And then each session will have a pretest. We will go over the results of the pretest and we will explain what normal is if you're normal and healthy. We'll go into some of the strategies that you can use or compensations that you can use to overcome this. And then we'll go into some activities or exercises to reinforce this. So each session you will receive a full complement of this. We will send you home with some exercises or activities or something to be doing that relates to this course and some of the notes related to the course. And we'll meet back the following Tuesday and move from there. The idea of the course is it's set up to begin with the fundamentals that many of you know but what happens is a lot of people don't employ the fundamentals into daily practice to really be able to change their functional activity tolerance or how much you can move before you're breathless. So what we wanna do is really break that down and explain a little bit more about it, which we will do today, and then talk about some strategies, how to avoid that problem, and ways that you can compensate for energy issues. Today, what we're gonna talk about is a little bit about the breathlessness and in terms of the breathlessness, how that changes when you're moving. So I wanna put up something on the screen for a second, and it's called the Modified Breathlessness Scale. And you've probably seen this before, and it rates subjectively how you feel related to your, um, your state as to where you are, whether that be that you are in that state at rest or in that state with activity. And they go from one to five, one being that you're having no issue, everything feels just completely normal. And I mean normal in the sense of how it would feel if you were healthy and well. Um, Two would be short of breath only when you're exerting yourself. Three is you not only have to walk slower, but you have to stop quicker. Four would be you can only walk for a very limited amount of time or just a few minutes because you have to stop to take breaths. And five would be you just can't even leave the house. Possibly you can't even dress without being short of breath. And the reason why this is relevant is that you're going to go ahead and grade yourself in a terms of how you feel breathlessness. We're going to start with an exercise and a test to see how you all feel now. And then we're going to see how you feel after we finish today. And what we're going to do is work on taking a deep breath. And then when you're taking a deep breath, what I want you to do is sound out loud and count one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000 until you can't hear your voice anymore. So it would be a deep breath. 
one 1,000, two 1,000, three 1,000, four 1,000, and you would continue until you could not talk anymore. And that's really your stop point. When you can no longer vocalize in the clear voice that you were before, that's your stop point. And I'm gonna take a second and let you all try this and see what is your initial stop point at how many seconds? Okay, I think most of you probably are done. I can't tell, but I'm going to assume that you're mostly done. And what I want you to do is keep that number in mind. It's more important relatively what that number is now as comp compared to either the end of the session or really probably after you start practicing these maneuvers. But what I want you to notice is how deep of a breath you take relates to how much you can talk or do something. So it's really important that we can take a deep breath. And a deep breath starts from your belly or your diaphragm. So it's down here. What I want you to start with is just to slightly recline back. So you can be in the chair like this or whatever. And put one hand at your upper chest and one hand on your belly. And start breathing and see which hand is rising, and if they're both rising, which is rising more. Take some nice deep breaths. Notice which hand is rising. If you're taking a deep breath, you should feel your hand on your belly come out when you breathe in. If you're not taking a deep breath and you're not getting that air all the way down to the bottoms of your lungs, you're gonna feel more up here in your upper chest. Some of you may also be even using your shoulders to compensate where you take a deep breath in like this and then blow out. So that's even taking it a step further and using what we call accessory muscles or extra muscles that you shouldn't need to breathe to um, bring up your rib cage and allow your diaphragm to expand. So the first thing I want to work on is just simply having you learn how to do the diaphragmatic breathing properly using a purse slip technique. Now, not everybody needs a purse slip technique. Um, it works well for many cases. So if this is not an instance where it works for you in terms of what you've been told to do, go about breathing the way that you should breathe. But otherwise, I want you to breathe in with your nose and out through your mouth. But when you breathe in through your nose, I want you to really see if you can get that air down to your belly here. And as you'll find is, as you can get more air down, you'll start to feel your hand come up. Most people do better in a reclined position, usually with their eyes closed. So try to shut everything out and just pay attention to your breathing. Try to keep your shoulders down and relaxed. Try not to hike them up. And see if you can start getting that air to come down to this bottom hand and push this bottom hand out. Most people start by saying this will never happen or I can't do that. But what you'll find is a lot of times, if not most times, people just forgot how to breathe normally. So they're used to taking short breaths and not really filling up their lungs. So that's an exercise that you should take home with you to work on. What you can find is if you can fill your air in your lungs more, you get more oxygenation. Just like a car that has gas, the more oxygen you have, the more energy you're going to have. So if you fill your tank up only half full, you're not going to go as far as if you fill your tank up in full. Also important is that you exhale completely. 
that's the purse lip breathing blowing out, is trying to get all the carbon, carbon monoxide out so that you can breathe easier. So the, the carbon dioxide keeps you from filling your lungs again. So we have to empty that all out and bring more room in for the oxygen. What I usually tell people to get is at the dollar store or dollar general, they have pinwheels. They may look different than this, but they're really nice and they're a good visual. So what you can do is get one. They're about a dollar. Um, make sure it spins easy for most people. So it may not spin easy for you, but it will. But it should spin easy for whoever has healthy lungs. Take a deep breath in. Try to get it down to your belly and blow it out. Now, if you're taking a deep breath and you're sufficiently filling up your lungs, you should feel it spin. And you could even spin it even faster. If you're not, you're gonna find you're here struggling to spin it. So it's a good visual biofeedback tool that you can use to see how good of a breath am I taking? If you're taking a good breath, you should be able to spin it to about here at least. If you're taking a great breath, you may be able to get it to out here. You also are able to spin it longer if you have a good breath than if you have a short breath and you're just gonna go a little bit. Um, if you have grandkids or um, small children, you can use bubbles. Bubbles are good also for, you have to get a good breath in and then blow the bubbles out. So again, it's still teaching you that technique. And most people learn that technique in cardio, um, cardiac and pulmonary rehab. But what I find is a lot of people only do it at rest. So what we wanna do is take that information from how to do it at rest and get to the point that you really can breathe comfortably with yourself back like this and that this hand is rising nicely and your shoulders are nice and relaxed. And then you bring it upright and you try to do it in an upright position. So now your diaphragm is being used a little bit to help you keep your upright posture. So you have to work a little bit harder. So you may have to start all over again to get to the point where again, you're taking a deep breath in and it's coming from your belly. Once you can do this, the next would be to come and stand up and see if you can do this in standing. You can use a um, device if you need it. We don't want you to fall. But the key is that in each position, you can maintain how does it feel when I breathe normally, okay? So, Key is that you can do that in each and every position. And it takes some time. I usually tell people, give yourself a little bit of time. Sometimes it can take a week for people to get it. You're very used to doing what you're used to doing. And people get used to feeling this is normal for me, but you don't remember what normal used to feel like when you could take a nice deep breath in. The second thing is making sure that you're breathing throughout the activity. Most people, and we'll actually try this with you, don't do their breathing fully throughout the activity. So what I want you to do is to find a chair that you can sit in without wheels. And to see, you can use your hands if you need to. You can have the chair raised if you need to. But see if when you come to stand, if you're breathing out and in the whole time. What I usually suggest to people is you take a deep breath in and as you're coming up, you blow it out. In and blow it out to come down. And most people tend to hold their breath. So what another thing you need to do is to remember, I should be using my oxygen while I'm working. You don't want to have to get to the top stand up and then play catch up. Now you're gonna to have to breathe, you're gonna be short of breath, you're gonna to have to play catch up. And people say, well, it's faster that way. And I will contend that you still are gonna spend that other amount of time catching your breath at some point and it's gonna equal out. 
So again, in order for you to get to the point where you can do more activity, the fundamentals are that not only can you take a deeper breath, but you can continue that oxygen exchange while you're burning it. So if you don't refuel, you're going to have to stop for a pit stop. So one of the things that I like people to do is to take this with them when they're walking. Now, you can use it with a walker or anything. If it has a nice long handle, it's great because then you can keep it close to you. But you still have that visual. And it doesn't matter if it's really spinning or not. What matters is that you are trying to breathe while you're doing it, okay? So just the act of you trying is going to get you further, okay? Now, with that, one of the things that we like to talk about is being efficient. So in order to be efficient, we want our muscles to be able to take in the oxygen and our muscles to be able to use that oxygen efficiently. So if I'm in strong, my legs are strong, I'm gonna be able to go further than if my legs are weak. So you may not think that your legs are weak, but if you're burning more oxygen and it's because your leg muscles are getting tired, the probability is that they're not as strong as they need to be. And that's another course we'll go into, but that's the reason why the strengthening besides other reason is important because you use the oxygen as energy in everything you do, whether you're sleeping, whether you're walking, whether you're laying down and just, just resting. When you are looking at those things, what you want to keep in mind is, am I breathing? Am I continuing to breathe? Am I breathing fully? Am I getting rid and emptying my lungs fully so that I can take that next breath in fully? And do I hear myself breathing hard or fast? Most people with a chronic lung disease get used to feeling crappy. There's really no better way to say it than if you've got a fair um, significant amount of lung disease, you're pretty much used to being short of breath and that's your new norm, but it's not your norm. And what we really need you to do is to get in touch with your body and say, okay, how fast am I really breathing? Most people, if you're breathing a normal respiratory rate and volume, are breathing anywhere from 12 to 18 times a minute. And you can count this and check for yourself by just putting your hand on your belly or your upper chest if you're not at the point where you're really pushing out with your belly. And in 15 seconds, see how many times your hand rises and falls. So if my hand rises and falls four times in 15 seconds, it's going to be four times four for 60 seconds or 16 times a minute. I usually suggest to people to at least go for 30 seconds because 15 seconds and shaving off one short or one long is going to give an altered number. Ideal would obviously be that you can time yourself for a minute or have somebody time you for a minute. And then you get what your normal respiratory rate is at this point in time. As you get to where you're taking deeper breaths and breathing out, you will find that your respiratory rate will go down. You won't have to work as hard for you to get that oxygen that you need. Many of you have pulse oximeters that will measure for you what your oxygenation is. And that's well and good to a point, but the problem is if you're not paying attention to the quality of your breathing, as long, uh, along with the oxygenation, then you don't have a really good picture of where you are. I've had customers who can breathe that they can keep their oxygen up above 90, 
but they're breathing 30, 35 times a minute to get there. So they're working hard. Do you think they're going to last very long? No, you're going to have to revert back, find something easier for yourself to do, to compensate and to catch your breath again. The key is we don't want you to get there. So it's important that you start to listen to how am I breathing? What am I using to breathe? Am I breathing through my diaphragm? Are my shoulders relaxed? Am I able to sit upright and breathe? Or do I have to be braced like this to breathe? Once you're in tune with your body and you're starting to feel what point you're at, you can really start to see how much you can improve. And this will happen even with people in late stage chronic lung disease. People get used to doing what they're used to doing and they also get sped up because they've been dealing with this for a long time and it feels like you're not getting anywhere. It feels like you're putting all this effort and it's not going anywhere. A lot of times it's really technique. It's not that you don't have the tools, it's that you don't know the technique to use in terms of when to use it and how to use it. So everybody understands, breathe in through the nose, blow out through the mouth. But do you understand that that is a continuum that continues throughout, right? You don't stop, start, stop, start. So I don't know how many of you can go from your bedroom to your bathroom without stopping, but I'm gonna ask you to evaluate that in terms of how many breaths per minute are you taking to get there. I found many people can get there and even their oxygen still looks good, but their breathing has gone up dramatically. So the work has increased. And again, if the work has increased, you're not gonna be able to go as far. Most people want to be able to sustain an activity for a length of time. So you need to either conserve your energy or spread it out so that you're not using it as much so that you can go further. So the next time that you get up and you go for a walk to the kitchen or to the bathroom or vice versa, take your respiratory rate before you start. And then when you end up where you need to be, take your respiratory rate again and see where you are. I would be inclined to believe that most of you, your respiratory rate has gone up. You may think that that's because, well, of course, because I walked, but I would contend that I can show you and teach you with these strategies, how your breathing can be the same at the end of the walk as in the beginning of the walk, your oxygen's gonna be just as good and you're gonna feel like you could go further. You'll start by going slower. So in order for you to pay attention to what's going on, you have to go slower. You can't rush through this. So once you've gotten to the point where you can take nice, slow, deep breaths correctly and you're breathing well standing, you're going to try to walk a few feet and pay attention to your breathing. Am I breathing nice and deeply? And I don't mean, I just mean taking a breath in so that your belly is filling up. So your lungs are filling up and your belly is going out. If you're doing this and your rate is normal, then you're doing it correctly. If you're doing this and your rate a respiratory rate is going up, or you're suddenly starting to go like this, you've lost it after a while and you have to continue on. It doesn't take as long as people think usually to get this going better. A lot of times I'd say about a week in, people are really starting to get that aha moment. You can put your hands here even to see, are your, are your rib cages going out? Because when you take a deep breath in, your belly goes forward and your rib cage goes out. And that's because your lungs are expanding that whole area. When you've got to that point that you can take a few steps, then you try to extend the distance a little bit. Maintaining the fact that you wanna keep your oxygenation at a good level, 
For some of you, keeping it above 88 is where you should be. For some of you, above 90. Um, I like to say 92. I think once you get below 90, if you don't have that threshold that you're set at, it's better to stay at 92 and above. And even better would be not to drop at all. But the next step is, again, making sure that your respiratory rate stays low or lower. So you are going to go up a little. So you may go from 16 to 18 or 19, but now you're not going up from 16 to 25, 27. When you get to that point, you will start to realize that you feel better. And that's because you're not working as hard to do the same thing. It may take you a little while for you to be able to increase your speed but you will be able to increase your speed once you can do it at a slow pace. So again, start slow, start small. And as you build from there, you find that over the course of several weeks, you not only can walk further, you can walk further with your breathing under control, with your oxygen good, and suddenly you feel better. And I, like I said, I have found most people, even though they've been through rehab, don't understand how to put it all together. The other aspect that I find is it's one of those things that you have to keep doing. And that's the unfortunate part of a chronic illness. It's not like we do the right things and the cold goes away and we're back to square one again. Unfortunately, we have to deal with what we have. We know it's a progressive disorder, but we also know that we can control the rate in which it progresses. There's a lot of scientific evidence to show that doing the right things under most circumstances, your progression will go much, much slower. And I've had people again in stage four for quite a while. So even though they're at the last stage of their disease process, they're still able to get out into the family room, spend time with their grandkids and their family, able to eat. That's another aspect is if you're breathless when you're eating, again, that one part is recognizing how you're breathing. There are other aspects to it that we'll go into in the course because there, it's not a single dimensional thing, but one aspect is when you're eating, you should be able to eat and possibly hold a conversation, but at the very minimal, be able to eat comfortably. If you're not, the first thing would be to step back and to say, let me think about how I'm breathing, let me think about when I'm breathing, and let me make sure I can continue to breathe. Because again, most people are used to just holding their breath a little bit. It's just a normal, natural thing that you get used to doing. But I contend again, you get to the end of where you can't hold it anymore and you play catch up. So with that, what I wanted to talk about next was, where do you go from here? Well, certainly we're going to go into this in much greater depth, um, much more elaborate and really extend it out. Because most people, what they really want is to be able to breathe okay and to be able to do something. You know, they're really tired of being limited by their lungs. They're tired of being limited into their house. They're tired of the quality of life. And I would say that the quality of life is somewhat under your control. And I think that's the thing that's the most empowering for most people is that they don't realize that they are actually factoring in part of the problem, but they're also part of the problem because they don't understand what they need to do how to do it, when to do it. And it's such a joy to see when we're wrapping up sessions with people, how different things are. I had one gentleman who didn't want to let me in the room, in the house rather. He'd been through cardiac rehab, pulmonary rehab. He had had home therapy three times. He had been through, he could, um, he could basically tell you personal breathing till the cows come home and show you when he's sitting. He could not do it to get to the bathroom. It took him 10 minutes to get to the bathroom. Now this is a man who already had incontinence. Can you imagine how terrible this is for them? And then if he coughs, he's really bad. 
we had to really work on him not rushing to go to the bathroom because he has this urgency to go, but really learning how to go so that you can go continuously. Because what happened was he would go, he'd be so short of breath, he'd have to stop. He would try to rush again. He would have to stop. He would have to rush again and he would stop. So he stopped about three or four times. And I'm not talking about stopping for a brief second. I'm talking about stopping for a minute to get his oxygen levels up to what I felt comfortable with for him to proceed ahead. When he got to the point that he could go to the bathroom, he said I could stay. (laughs) So we worked further from there and he was so surprised that he could sit at rest without even trying. And he would say, Jay, look at this. I'm just breathing naturally, normally. And his, this is stage four breathing problems. He's got chronic lung problems, chronic heart problems, chronic kidney problems. Mm-hmm. Very overweight from lack of inability to move. And he has everything going against them and suddenly things are working. So what do we do differently? We explained it to him. We told him what was going on and why. If you don't understand the why, I find most people have a really hard time sticking with it, particularly if you've been through the process before. It's like, you know, been there, done that. That's basically what he said to me. When we finished, he was going out to lunch with his grandkids, which were his pride and joy because they came over every day day and he babysat them with his wife or really his wife babysat them and he would basically be a passive observer in his chair when we got to the point where he could go out I saw him smile for the first time in eight weeks I hadn't seen him smile at all but finally eight weeks later I saw them smile and he begrudgingly said that this was worthwhile oh so my hope was that he would continue it because he saw the positive results. And I think once you see the positive results, then it's worth the effort. But if you do it and you do it and you're not seeing any gain for it, it's like, why bother? You know, I'm doomed, I'm stuck with this. But again, I would contend with this course, my hope is, and my success has been, People have really made positive strides. I've taken people off of eight liters of oxygen for short periods of time so that they could go to the kitchen without the tubing attached. I've had people where they actually could sit up in bed for a while when they couldn't sit up in bed before. I had a woman who could go up the stairs. She was depressed from other reasons, um, but she was suicidally depressed. Imagine trying to motivate somebody like that. So I really feel for her, but I'm like, you know what? You'll feel so much better if you can get upstairs and be with the rest of your family. Well, I can't do that. We got her so she could get upstairs with her family. Now I came back to see her again because she got pneumonia and we had to come back and see her. She was upstairs. I almost didn't recognize her because we spent the first four weeks in what I call the dungeon. She was on the sofa in the dark with the oxygen tubing on. So I didn't even see her face really well until the very end. She was smiling. She was happy. She still had these other issues going on that she had to address, but she was actually willing to address them. That made my week. I I didn't need anything more that made my week. It was just so gratifying to see that it brought her life back. So I'm going to wrap it up with just saying that I'd like you to really be open-minded that a lot of this is really in how you do it. Not that you do it, but how you do it and the quality of how you do it. And we'll leave it at that. And I hope to see you for our session. Some of this will be a little bit of a repeat because obviously this is an important concept to bring up even to people, but we're gonna also talk a little bit more about how you monitor that besides counting. All right, I hope this was helpful and I hope you have a nice day and thank you for joining us and bye-bye.